Good afternoon, everyone. Good evening, everyone, and good morning, depending on where in the world you're joining us from. Uh, my name is Venkat Kotamaraju, um, and I have the pleasure of being your host for this session. And of course, I have the privilege of moderating the conversation between three fantastic experts from the RNG sector in Bangladesh. Uh, the session, as you know, is about focuses on product diversification and how this is actually relevant from the point of uh, safeguarding the interests of the women workers in Bangladesh. Um, thank you, BRAC and h &M Conversation for a lovely conference over three days. Uh, the conversation, to say the least, is much needed, uh, more relevant today than ever. Um, and we couldn't have had uh, better experts than three panelists that I have with me. Um, so let me start by introducing the three panelists. And gentlemen, if I have the permission, I'll start with the lady in the house. Quick thumbs up. Yes, please. Want. Yes, please. Um, so first of all, uh, Shwapna, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, Shwapna, as most of you might actually know her, uh, she's currently the country manager for Marks & Spencer Bangladesh. She has been in this role since 2013. Um, rightly so, she considers herself 100% made in Bangladesh. She's born and brought up here. Um, under her leadership, Marks & Spencer Bangladesh has actually tripled its exports. And within the Marks & Spencer Global Organization, they, uh, she's turned uh, Bangladesh into the number one RMG exporting country. Uh, a testament to the fact is that within the global operations framework, uh, her global network actually looks up to Bangladesh as a role model. Um, she's also quite actually active in uh, various community-based projects, and the biggest of them, uh, and I think it deserves a, a, a big mention here, is a project that she's led, uh, which creates employment for physically challenged people. Uh, to date, uh, it employs about 3,500-odd physically challenged workers uh, who are employed in factories, and her endeavor is to make sure that uh, the physically challenged workers or the differently abled workers are actually uh, a mainstream in the workforce. Um, both national, nationally and internationally, she's been recognized as a role model for creating women leaders in the factories in the RMG sector. Prior to joining to, uh, Marks & Spencer in 2006, she of course had the opportunity to work with uh, the British retailer Next and the US retail giant Walmart. Um, one of the things that she fondly remembers is her first job as an intern where, you know, she was part of an office of 250 people where the only other woman worker was the telephone operator. Um, clearly, as you can see, she's come a long way. Um, but the beauty of it is that she uses her own journey in advocating for more women leaders in an otherwise male dominated industry at the moment. So Shwapna, thank you so much again, and it's such a pleasure to have you in this uh, wonderful conversation. Thank you very much, and thank you very much, uh, BRAC and h &M Foundation for making me the part of the session. I'm truly honored and humbled. Thank you. Wonderful. Um, then let me come to uh, Professor Momen Abdul Mohamed. Uh, Professor, is, uh, Mo Professor Momen is currently a professor at the Institute of Business Administration at the University of Dhaka. Uh, he's also the director of Bangladesh Employers Federation and a former director of BGMEA. Uh, his family has been in the textile business for a very long time, catering to both the local market as well as exports, uh, including two life lifestyle brands, Pride and Urban Troop. Uh, their operations in the netwear segment uh, is vertically integrated from yarn to garments. Now, uh, one of the things that Professor Moman is very well recognized within the industry is uh, as, as a knowledge powerhouse, um, simply for the fact that he straddles both the worlds, which is the industry and the academia. So, uh, Professor Momen, um, lovely to have you and such a pleasure to uh, have you. Thank you for making the time. Thank you so very much. And thank you for giving me this opportunity uh, in, in, in having this discussion. Thank you. Lovely. And last but not the least, uh, Ziao Rahman, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, Zia, as you might know, is the uh, currently the regional country manager for uh, production, and he oversees Bangladesh, Pakistan, and Ethiopia at H&M. Uh, his career spans 19 years, and it brings a lot of experience, uh, and more importantly, a lot of enthusiasm for 
building the textile supply chain. Um, prior to his current role as the regional country manager, he was with H&M Indonesia, where he served as the head of supply chain, primarily responsible for sourcing and production for Indonesia. And of course, before that, he's worn several hats um, uh, at H&M Bangladesh, predominantly uh, involving business development. Uh, Zia holds an MBA and is a core trainer at H&M. Um, again, very much like uh, Shwapna, he's from Bangladesh, spent most of his childhood and schooling years in Dhaka, and he's currently based out of Dhaka with his family. So Zia, thank you so much again for making the time and such a pleasure to have you. It's an absolute pleasure for me to be here. Thank you so much. Thank Wonderful. you. Looking forward to it. Likewise. Well, um, let me get started because this is such a wonderful conversation and the timing of it on the back of, uh, you know, the crisis and the unprecedented times that we've seen as an industry or as a world over the last year and a half. And um, I wanted to kind of put together a broad framework of how we want to see the next one hour of the conversation, right? So first of all, I think all four of us um, believe and love the fact that we would have an open, interactive conversation rather than a structured Q&A. So I would urge each one of you to, you know, build on each other's thoughts and reflect on each other's thoughts. And please feel free to jump in as we go. Um, and I'll start the conversation with a couple of questions that will help set the context and probably if I may uh, help establish a shared and common understanding of why are we here today to talk about such an important topic, right? Um, but what we also want to do within this, within this one hour is to make time for about 10 minutes towards the end for Q&A from the audience side. Uh, but before we close in, I would love for the four of us to actually reflect on our conversation and arrive at a very broad framework or a pathway, if, if I may, a draft pathway on what do we invest in today? What are those priority areas? Where do we invest in today so that we're able to realize this future where the RMG sector has embraced technology, has embraced innovation, and is truly on this path uh, of achieving product diversification and as uh, I'm an innovation consultant, so bear, bear with the language, but we say, how do we raise the cost of disengagement? How do we make sure that we've truly cemented uh, the Bangladesh RNG sector in the role that it plays in the global supply chains? So thank you so much again, and let's uh, get the proceedings underway. Um, Professor, if I may uh, start with you, uh, would love to hear your thoughts on what is really changing that makes this conversation so important? Why is this attention on product diversification and the focus on how do we safeguard the women workers? Why is it really relevant? And what is changing from a market perspective? What trends are emerging that makes it such an important topic for discussion today? Thank you. <clears throat> what I think uh, uh, probably the, the reason we are having this conversation it's probably the fact that we are all anticipating a big change in the technology with the fourth industrial revolution. There is sustainability issue that is coming to the forefront. Then there is uh, also a challenge or a, or a constant pressure for improving the product basket that we are having because we, it's very much focused into few areas. And we have seen that in certain uh, innovations or in certain uh, technological improvements, there has been some loss of jobs by the women who are working in the industry. So that probably is the reason for which it is, uh, it is becoming important to discuss about this issue, that whether innovation and product diversification will eventually reduce women's job prospects in the garment industry. So if you want to know why it is important, why this discussion is coming up, I think this is the thing. And the other thing you want to do, you ask that what are, change, what are the changes that are coming in the industry in general? I think sustainability is becoming a bigger issue. Circular economy is also becoming important. 
you know, shorter lead time or is shorter turnaround time is also becoming all the more important. So, and also e-marketing, e, e, you know, some sort of electronic marketing, like not big and mortar shop, you know, this, uh, uh, those are becoming, I think, more and more important. And the pandemic has, I think, uh, uh, kind of improved, increased the pace of this transformation. So those are the two things, uh, you know, two questions that you have asked. I think this is what is happening in the industry. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Momin. Um, Shwapna or Zia, uh, would love to hear uh, your reflections on the question. Well, maybe. May I go, Shwapna? Please. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I think if you look at the industry's, uh, you know, movement, there was a time in uh, Manchester was producing garments. Then it moved to Japan, it moved to Korea, it moved to Turkey, China, it come here. And uh, it's a significant journey that, you know, that for the last 40 years, Bangladesh has taken. And uh, if you see the, from, uh, you know, since the liberation, it's like 50 years journey that Bangladesh has, uh, I think we have come across quite a lot. And uh, uh, we, we can be very proud for this, that, okay, from a graduation from LDC to mid-income country, it works a little bit negative of this, if you start producing only basic T-shirt. So that's just one context that is travel, the product going to travel from right. market to market because it is, it works. It's a highly labor intense production and it works against actually uh, if, the, uh, if the country is growing you know, economically faster or is growing healthier. So you need to adapt actually based on that. And uh, if Bangladesh, let's say uh, the uh, per capita is going $5,000, I don't think we know where can compete that, okay, we can produce a T-shirt anymore. It doesn't make sense in that case. So the product diversification is really needed. Okay, now let's come to what did we do last 40 years? If you look at 2019, uh, because just before the pandemic, I, I, I still refer that, we ship around $34 billion from this market and 70% came from only five different product category. So that's the harsh reality that right. we didn't really diversify our production, you know? And then the country economy is growing. Our per capita is more than $2,000 now. So it, got, it will go faster because if you see the forecast of the GDP growth, it will grow. So it will grow against the basic garments production capability. So these cases, I need this diversification is a must. And now the moment you connect the woman, it has a different perspective at the same time, you know? Because there was a time 80 to 90% of our workforce are women in the industry. I'm talking about labor perspective, you know, uh, directly. But, and that percent has drastically gone down over the year. Now it's around 40, 60% in our supply chain. I, I, I don't know the full picture of it, but that reflects more or less uh, the average of the industry. And these people is not, they, they just disappear. I think it has a social uh, responsibility as well, because women... Uh, in a study, it shows that women works at least two to three hours more than a men in a daily work because they take care of their house because that's, this is how the social structure it is. And then they take care of their work as well. And when they get married, it becomes an obvious the kids should be raised by the women. <laughs> you know? So it's a social part. So we are losing a huge experience when they're leaving it. And then the moment you put an uh, industrialization, you put an automation on top of that, I think it become really, really vulnerable. How the upscaling of this, because the education systems are not, it's not designed like this, that women will get the more access. So it's a very relevant questions here, uh, how, why the diversity is really needed. I'm gonna stop it here. Shopna. Perfect. Thank you, Zia. Shopna. Thank you very much again for making me the part of this uh, you know, session. I think I look at it from a very different angle. Uh, I think uh, the moments of touch based on this a little bit. While we're actually celebrating our 50 years of independence, uh, one thing you cannot ignore, the economic growth that we have actually shown, okay? And in this South Asian nation, we are, you know, one of the largest that you cannot actually ignore. And one of the key factors being, obviously, the RMG sector, which is 84% of the total export. And... The reason the diversification comes because I think we have made the entrepreneurs, the brands, the you know uh, the workers, 
we have made significant improvement. The growth had been phenomenal. And we became, uh, as a nation, as an industry, as the market leader for having the highest number of green factories, okay, making sure, you know, skilling the, prod, uh, the workers on that. And I think these are the milestones that we have created and the infrastructural changes that we have made, you know, which is exemplary to the rest of the world. Now, what is next? Okay, what are the next challenges, set of challenges that we are going to face? And I think I look this pandemic in a sense that we have learned it in a very difficult time that how to survive and react and respond to unknown path that you are probably going to navigate in the future. Because this pandemic is probably not going to be the end of the world. And what, what uh, Zia has mentioned in terms of having this basic product, so if I give you the example of, uh, let's say even Marx Spencer, I remember when I joined in the business, uh, uh, the practical example is we started with the basic products in Bangladesh. And I think probably the two major reasons that I have joined in, the, in this industry, one is having, you know, changing that landscape that female cannot be the executives, number one. The other one was changing the image. So ever since I joined in the business, I think one of the key things me and my team, we have taken on board is that how do we make it sustainable, number one? And then number two, this image of making only the core products and basic products, okay? And then interestingly, you can actually be very successful when you have the partners are actually playing their right part. So for example, a couple of years back when I started making the suit in Bangladesh, okay? Uh, I remember, I always give this example that, you know, taking those samples in a suitcase. And I don't know for how many times I was told that there is no way we are going to make, you know, those value-added products there. And I think I was definitely very persistent. And every time we developed the products, every time we made sure that we take those learnings from the knowledge tank we, we have and transfer it to the workers that are making those products. So A, since we have made this phenomenal you know, uh, milestones in green technology and all of that, we have already created the foundation of making great products. Yes, it could be uh, the core essential products. And there lies the, there lies the opportunities to yeah. go and upscale and make diversified products. And it's possible. Fantastic. Well, I love the fact that you know, we've, we've automatically switched it from looking at it as a challenge to saying this is actually an opportunity because You've clearly, as you've indicated, Swapna is, as an industry, we've built the foundation. We've uh, created those milestones. We've had the track record of reaching where we are today as a top three uh, manufacturing economy in the world. Significant contribution to the country's uh, economic growth as well. Now, let me offer you a different lens, right? And I would love for each one of you to um, paint a picture because this is crucial for all of us within the industry and for the audiences as well to kind of internalize this. How would you paint a picture that if we did not invest in building this muscle in product diversification, building this know-how and the uh, expertise and value-added products, Shwapna, as you were saying, what would that mean for the Bangladesh RMG sector, right? So. I'm offering you a different lens. So yes, we've got a fantastic history. We've got a very checkered history. Uh, we have the foundation, but uh, clearly there is a reason why we are having this conversation, right? And we've learned it the hard way over the last year and a half. But I would love for each one of you to briefly paint a picture of, in your view, what would happen to the RNG sector in Bangladesh if we were to not invest and build this muscle around product diversification or value-added products. So let me go the other way around. So Shwapna, if we could start with you and then follow the cycle around. Okay, <clears throat> no problem. Uh, I think, as I said, uh, Mohan Bhai actually said that in the, in the initially that sustainability, we won't be able to sustain the foundation, the industry that we have built together. And the market is changing. Okay, if you look at from the brand's perspective, from the trends perspective, it's changing every day. So if you do not react to it, if you do not work on, first of all, looking at the products, designing the products, 
if you say yes we have got fantastic set of factories but if you look at offering innovation okay you can only have handful of factories that can actually come up with that product elevation I so see. if you do not come into with that investment in terms of having those set of technicians set of you know product designers we won't be able to elevate the products now as i said from the foundation how do we go to the next level now how do we kind of like align ourselves to the global trend yeah otherwise you you will be only left with uh, those poor products where obviously you will be always in that price pressure and the basket that you have mentioned that basket will not be there number one number two is obviously the technology now if you if you look at vietnam the way they have actually taken that elevation of the products to the next level coming up with quicker lead time coming up with having a very great partnership with those mills that they source from the trim suppliers they source from and they have within a very short time if you look at 10 years marks i mean uh, bangladesh versus vietnam the way they have elevated those products and then they have been benefiting out of that profitability as well so having those r and d and making sure that you are actually investing in that people process and the technology it's it's going to make it again it's, as i said more sustainable and more profitable as well so there is no option that you are actually going to not going to talk about it or not going to take that initiative fantastic uh, speaking about innovation and zia if i could uh, if i could move to uh, professor momen yes please uh, Professor, in in one of our earlier conversations, you mentioned a a very interesting point that stuck with me and resonated with me um, very much. You spoke about the idea that you know normally in a in a in a dominant narrative globally, we see innovation in the light of being disruptive. And you spoke about when we you spoke about the fact that you know as an industry, as individuals, as organizations. um uh, when we think of innovation or when we think about technology for that matter we need to embrace the fact that technology and innovation and humans can coexist right would love for you to kind of delve into that and talk to us about how you see this balance between embracing technology while also safeguarding the interests of the human uh, workers thank you again uh i'll touch upon a bit on the earlier question and then i'll come back on this uh you see all these factories are shopna was referring to over the last 40 years if you look at the statistics you will probably see that those factories don't exist anymore they have, who have stopped investing so there you know each of us you know i have been in the circular knit area or rather uh they call it what circular knit and flat knit so the product that is normally made out of circular knit we have at least transformed ourselves overall ourselves four times in the last 30 years so when we started off we had very low tech with conventional winch with tubular products etc then we moved gradually to a high pressure high temperature now an open weight and finally we are now having you know computerized equipments with automatic dispensing and robotic dispensing and all of that in terms of dye house in terms of you know the product you are now you know looking at probably a huge jump but there has been a consistent i would say product diversification going on when in many of these factories were initially producing only basic t-shirt that were tubular so now we are making and they were very seasonal to summer or when a sweater factory was only seasonal for winter orders and so on and so forth now most of these factories they run 24 i mean no 24 12 months of a, a year because they are having products that are there for summer winter and you know in between transitions so both top bottom etc so this wouldn't have been possible if the factories were not investing in the in the products in the people in the systems it wouldn't have been possible so i would say that with the when you ask that what happens if we don't diversify if we don't invest 
nobody survive nobody can survive we have to, it is not only shopna mentioned reactive it is not only reactive we have to be proactive so we have to come up with innovations we have to offer things to our market so that you know we we can we can stand out with this so now to come back to your second part of the question that you have asked me uh, which i often talk about is innovation is somehow looked at parallel with disruption why would it be like that why can't innovation be there without being disruptive i mean there has been there have, over the years if you look at first industrial revolution second third and now fourth every time there were disruptions and there were also other but maybe this time the disruption would be much more it going to impact much more so what i'm trying to say a country like ours where we have got even currently we have got a huge population to be kept employed so we should try and innovate so that we can have these jobs you know alive and we and we have to come up with some unique ideas in which we can embrace the technology as well as still not be disruptive of letting go of the jobs so let's say you know a, a sweater factory used to be a manual one it has been replaced by a jacquard machine but then you know if you so you have replaced some employment you know and but now if you can embellish on that product if it's a ladies wear you know if you can embellish with some of the crafting on it so maybe you can employ some more people maybe you can create some uh some of this embellishment elsewhere as a separate line of product and that can come into a production line and be assembled with the product so these are the various ways i am not i cannot give you many many examples but i'm sure if the product designers the craftsmen in the factory if they start talking and collaborating with each other i think there will be more and more avenues that will open up for us where we can you know keep It, you know, embracing innovation but not be so disruptive so this is what i'm trying to say and the other thing i mentioned in that talk that you referred to is also very aligned with this thought is i think as a country we have been labeled in the past as a large scale volume manufacturer low price and all of that we are trying to graduate as we are graduating from a mid lower income to a middle income country we are also trying to graduate from this this sort of concepts and notions that our people are possessing in their minds so i think it is time enough for us that we should try and portray the world that some uniqueness some you know core uh, i mean attribute that can only be possible to have in bangladesh so what i'm trying to say you know the last two years i was in the board of bjme and they have packed, you know been preaching one thing that we have to export our culture so when i say when we export our culture we want to incorporate our cultural element in the designing phase so we can engage our craftsmen also alongside our manufacturing processes that way we can embrace technology it can be a high tech robotic production with a crafted something on the on the thing so you you kind of you know blend them together it can be a hand loom product but it is pitched you know it is shrink a pre shrink it can be you know we can do tons of things on it and then you assemble it can be small patches on it so i think the designers can come up with products like that so i think i leave it here let the other speaker you know take it up from there thank you perfect uh, professor mohan i love the point that you're making about exporting culture and i think that's where the uh, you know as you as you started on the point about how humans and technology can coexist and there is still a lot of skills that humans bring in that can be a significant value add while we embrace automation and technology and um, any any form or dimension of technology that uh, manifests itself um i zia i want to come to you because we had this conversation about about technology and you uh, emphasize the point about how we need to build and i think this is something that shopna was uh, uh, touching upon earlier which is as we think about you know how we stack up against let's say a china or a vietnam for that matter um, and how they have been able to embrace it and they've been able to leverage that shift uh, in in the market um you spoke about the real need to build an ecosystem 
that focuses on investing in product development. So would love to hear your thoughts on where you think that ecosystem building and where you think or how you think that uh, that emphasis and that, uh, that that initiated behind product development could actually help us get along this, uh, this transition. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, I, before I start saying anything, uh, I will agree with uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Professor Momen what he said that if the diversity doesn't happen, we simply don't exist. Fully agree. And uh, so that's the first statement I must say. Uh, to answer your question regarding the ecosystem, uh, I will go back this again, the journey of the RMG as is travel. There was a time when uh, Korea was really famous for garments. I still remember in Bangladesh, a lot of people say, oh, we, these are the bunch of the people we send first to Desh, from Desh garments to Korea. And they came back. They are some of the very uh, you know, famous entrepreneurs in Bangladesh as well. And, and what happened there? If you look at today's cases, Korea is still produce garments, not in their land, they produce somewhere else. Right. So if you look at now Vietnam, what happened? is most of the industry that they have it for the textile is the foreign investment. And their product development already happened either in Seoul or in maybe Shanghai or maybe some part of the other world where they still design the product, develop it, and they just plug and play over there. So their kitchen is in Vietnam. So that's why Vietnam growth is much faster if you look at Bangladesh. But Bangladesh, on the other hand, we have a huge leverage that, okay, our strongest part is 95% plus investment is a local investment. So, right. you know, it makes sense that we are more, more sustainable here. So that's our strongest part. Okay, now this product development, if it, that doesn't happen, because if you look at our student coming out from the university, how many percentages are working in the product development? I will sadly say, uh, probably I will make some people unhappy as well. If I any given day go to any of my suppliers, the weakest team I will see is the product development in a factory. Very sadly, that's the truth. And that's the harsh reality today. We really need to come out of that. And uh, if you look at our education system, the curriculum that you have from there, the people who are, the, you know, the, the youngsters who are coming, how many of them are really in the working in the product development or the designing. Well, unfortunately, we don't have any retailing shops in Bangladesh. And I don't think in the next five years or 10 years is happening drastically. A lot of big brands are coming. I don't think that's going to happen. So we need to find a sustainable solution here. We must build our human resources. And there is no question about it because buying a machine is much more easier. And our entrepreneurs here, here are famous to buy machines. You tell something this is needed. There, if a consultancy company or a buying house, somebody tell, they see the business case, they go for it because investment has never been a problem. But investment on people, the person who work behind the machine is super important. And this is where we are really lacking. Okay, now that's about the local. Let's talk about the expat. There's a lot of expat also working in the industry. A lot of Indians work, Sri Lankan works. How many of them are working in the product development? Very few. They are mainly working on the productions or the marketing because their communication skills and other things. So we simply didn't invest a lot of time and effort for the product development or the innovation rather than we go for an easy uh, you know, investment. Okay, now, as you say, as you use the word ecosystem, let's go back to the uh, you know, backward linkage development. I don't think that our backward linkage will automatically will happen. All of a sudden, somebody will make a big factory who produce a man-made fiber and then look for the water here. That will not happen. Rather, it will go opposite. You should have a order first, you know, the garment producing here and then the backward will start because then the, because it's a demand and supply together. So if that demand and supply equation doesn't work, it will simply will not happen. So this building of this whole ecosystem is a, I think we need a clear roadmap what you want to do. And instead of going direct investment, investment on people is very, very important. I will emphasize that quite a lot. I'm going to stop it here. Perfect. Um, Shopna, before Wait, I can, I, can I just add two more points with uh, Zia as well, just with, with the product developments ecosystem, since you said, I think that ecosystem will have to be quite 360 degree as well. So if you look at, for example, the vertical setup, is still man-made fiber, we are just heavily dependent, uh, you know, to the rest of the world. I mean, it's coming from China, China, Taiwan, Korea, everywhere. 
but then the product that we are doing in bangladesh is majorly cotton products but then where is the world is actually moving towards the man made fiber so with that product development we have to come up with that investment for that backward linkage and for the fabrics so that we can actually tap on those markets as well and those product categories as well the second thing i will also say that you know it needs a lot of support from the government as well for example the logistics the support that we need making sure the import and export being very small in our logistic support based on the world bank uh, survey i think we came to uh, you know from 70 to now 100 and whereas again i'll take the vietnam's example they have probably 50 to 39 so that support system is very important to make that create that ecosystem as well i just wanted I to add this I can't agree more than this, Shapna. Thank you so much. Perfect, perfect. No, absolutely love it. So, uh, Zia, you you're talking about how uh, you know supply and demand has always been a chicken and egg situation, right? Because both sides can actually push the ball into the other sport and say, "Hey, why don't you come first?" Uh, but I love the idea that if you're building that capacity first, right? If you if you're able to create that options for the buyers for the brands to say, "Hey," Here is here is something more than just the basic products, the T-shirts, and something more than cotton. Then, if if I'm hearing you right, you're saying they will be takers, right? Because you've certainly built, you've certainly built the foundation. You certainly have, as an industry in Bangladesh, uh, you have the credibility where you're able to leverage that foundation, right? Uh, uh, Shobna, I want to come back to you about um, you. You spoke about the uh, the need for a shift in mindsets right because we are not just talking about innovation and product diversification and value added products in isolation but we are also talking about how this is going to be relevant because on the path to sustainability we always say that we need to make sure that the benefit of transitioning to a better growth that needs to be inclusive right so how do we how do we really safeguard the women workers who have been such a pivotal part of the rmg sector in bangladesh and i think that's also true for much of the global south uh, manufacturing economies would love to hear your thoughts on what kind of shift in mindsets do we need as we embrace product diversification as we embrace technology and innovation but something that also safeguards the interests of the women workers uh i think uh, monway was talking about the sweater industry just a couple of minutes back yeah now i'll give you a very shocking example of that so when we actually moved from this automated machines and i was very work- closely working with the sweater industry because we we buy uh, um, probably majority from from this country and while i was working with this factories one thing i have noticed that when we got this machines coming in uh the female workers actually left or probably they were moved to linking or mending more than coming or handling that main knitting machine and you will be i mean if i just take the average of the five big factories sweater factories that we work with 90% of the knitters actually are male whereas before that transition it used to be 50% perfect so that that's kind of like put you a question mark that Yes, does it actually really going hand in hand? Probably the reality is not that. Yeah. The reality might be very different. And that's where the shift in mindset is needed. And that will actually cup that will bring a lot of other things in the place. For example, increasing the efficiencies. In the factories, we still have got this mentality of, you know, doing more overtime. And the efficiency actually plays a bigger role there. second thing is having the right machineries where you can actually increase the efficiencies as well and then the especially i'm looking at only for the female workers they really don't have to look out for that additional hours rather than they can actually bring the efficiencies and they can actually be better in their work that's number 2 and number 3 is i think the well bank that how do we create this whole awareness of well being and i think obviously brands the third parties and the manufacturers will have to work hand in hand so that we inject that mentality to the female workers that they can actually be you know 
taking care of this the zia was staying the office part and then when she goes she doesn't actually do those additional hours and she actually goes home because she has got this right machinery at the right place so that she can be more efficient the second thing that i also wanted to talk about that how do we reskill and multi skill these women workers i really don't think there had been any collaborative approach uh, bring it from the government or from the you know uh, from bgma or from brand i think everybody got to play a part in there how do we make sure we institute institutionalize this reskilling and multi skilling for the female worker and when we do that we can actually safeguard the job and i'll give quickly give a very quick example so one of the manufacturers that we make actually the blazers and the suit the formal wear and then obviously 60% were the female workers and because of this you know uh, shift we moved to all core essential products people are working from home they are not really going out with this you know lovely blazers so the sell obviously dropped and then i was thinking the first thing that i was thinking that how do we make sure that we safeguard this 60% female worker and then obviously the you know the whole workforce of that factory and then we worked very closely with the manufacturers and then said that can we actually quickly multi skill this workers and instead of making blazer how do we make the gowns there or you know core essential products there so i think it's the development and skill set is going to come to a big play if you want to really safeguard that interest right thank uh, you no absolutely uh, wonderful points uh, shopna and uh, uh, clearly um, I, i think we all three all four of us agree that you know if we if you really need to move the needle if you really need to embrace technology innovation get on this path of uh, product diversification or even in fact market diversification and industry diversification for that matter it cannot be something that's done by one segment or one stakeholder it has to be a what we call collaborative and coordinated effort across uh professor moman i want to come to you because um you touched upon a point of you know as ashokna was talking about building those relevant skill sets or building the right capacity within these women workers so that they have relevance in the future future which is diversified uh, product diversification included which includes value added products um, and have elevated the rng sector within bangladesh um would love to hear your thoughts professor on how do we build these scalable skill sets right because at the end of the day shopna you spoke about one you know a uh, supply partner who was able to shift from making blazers to be able to make gowns now we all recognize uh, in our in our different capacities and our own capacities that that shift can possibly happen when it's personality driven or one individual driven but if you need to scale it across then it has to be process driven and professor would love to get your views on where do we invest and how do we go about building these scalable skill sets within the rmg sector uh okay i will like to go back if you allow me to comment on few of the things that has been discussed already sure uh, when we are comparing bangladesh with vietnam this has been rightly mentioned that these are foreign investment that came in and you know just got installed because of their fta's because of the in- infrastructure etc so they were already having the product you know i mean the raw material in the fabric is the most important raw material they were already having their customer class you know the the proper customers and the designs to do everything so now i remember you know i have been in this business for 35 plus years whenever we made something and went to a buyers like shopna or their or her boss in the headquarter i said that we have made this thing and they would like and appreciate and something like that and they would say okay but i am not buying this from bangladesh these are being bought from a different country so they actually label each class of product with a certain country so bangladesh was labeled all these years for high you know volume low price you know nos basic kind of products so that is gradually shifting but at a very low low pace they have rightly mentioned that there has to be investment in the backward you know system in uh, linkage or rather uh, fabrics 
and other accessories. Without having that basket, it is not possible. When you make a cardigan out of a cotton, then it is priced probably at the retail, let's say 15 or 19 euros. You make it with the acrylic, it's probably 25 euros. You make it with the same thing with, with uh, let's say, cashmere, it is 150 euros. So that it is actually the same cardigan and we did in the same factory, etc. So it's just the raw material changing and the price point shifting and also you're graduating. So what I'm saying that you have, again, man-made fiber and cotton, these are two different investments because the whole setup, the backward linkage is totally different. So those are investments that needs to happen, that changes has to happen. And, and the Vietnam issue is they, were, they just got lucky because the foreign investment came in and they, 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 they created an environment like that. But over here, these are organically over the years, we have developed it. And I'm not, I'm not also uh, uh, pessimistic. We are quite optimistic. We are going to also see those changes in this country. Now, going back to rescaling or keeping these female workers at work and how do we do that? I think of the things that has been talked about, there are a few other things that needs to happen also. There has to be some social changes. I mean, the mindset of the people, there has to be some culture or work culture related changes that has to happen. Whenever you are saying that, you know, we are not investing in our workers, as, a, as an entrepreneur sitting on the other side, I, I am investing so much into machineries. I want the results to come in. And why do I have to employ foreigners? Because I'm not having that skill, although we invest. And it was also said that in certain factories, product development is the least important area. Not in our case and not in many other cases. We, we employ very high importance to that. So I think female workers, there has to be some legal, you know, law related changes also. There, has, there are legal issues, there are social issues. There are also cultural issues that goes hand in hand with employing people. I'll explain you with a some simple example. We were visiting a Chinese factory around 10 p.m. at night. This was a fabric making factory. And myself, my daughter and my nephew, we were visiting. And it was a huge factory. They were having eight or 10 stenters, we call them. It's a finishing line. So, and we saw five or six women running all of these centers at 10 p.m. at night, okay? And they, I mean, this is impossible in the context of Bangladesh. You don't see these people working such huge machineries. But this has not, uh, this is not the case in certain other areas also. We see female drivers driving SUVs. We, in, in, with, you know, we see female workers riding motorbikes and cycles in the villages of Bangladesh. If that is possible, so there will be technological changes that will happen and the, and the female workers will have to be trained to adapt to those changes and they will be, they will be upscaled, they will be rescaled to those things and they will continue to work. So these are again issues that has to be dealt with as a society, that has to be dealt with as you know, our work culture has to be there and then there are also legal issues like how long a female worker can work, whether she can work in a shift, etc. Et those are legal issues that needs to be addressed also. If those and also the security issue. So we have to ensure security. We have to we have to give them the respect. And all of these things has to happen. And then I don't think there will be gender shouldn't be a problem in, the, in embracing technology. Gender should not be a problem, I repeat, in embracing technology. Over to you. Fantastic. Can I, can I also quickly add yeah. with uh, yeah. uh, moments about this uh, change in mindset as well. I think it's it's always often with the workers as well. I remember when we were driving, having this female, you know, uh, supervisors in the line. Uh, the male supervisors, they were existing in the factory or the GM. They would tell them that, you know, there is no way you can actually do this job. So this social stigma and the stereotypical thinking that, you know, she won't be able to handle this, uh, you know, big team, or she will not be able to stay uh, probably if needed for another extra hour for the work. So this mindset needs to change. And then I think management and the middle management, I will emphasize on the middle management. For example, when you actually talk to the owners, okay, they are very visionary. They have got all this, you know, visions. They want to change. They make sure that that gender gap is not there. 
but when it boils down to the middle management okay how much actually they embrace it that's something probably the entrepreneurs will have to definitely look into because when you actually give that confidence to them to the workers that you can actually do this job you will be able to do that they will definitely step up i mean we successfully have let's say 200 female supervisors and every one of them each one of them thought she can't really do it because 10 other male colleagues or the supervisors actually initially told them that you won't be able to do this job so yeah. this change in mindset is also very important perfect now thank you so much uh, for that uh, shopna and uh, professor mamun uh, we've got 10 minutes or in fact slightly under 10 minutes uh, before we wrap up so uh, with your permission uh, let me switch to questions from the audience um, we've got a couple of questions specifically directed at um, uh, each one of you but uh, let me start with zia uh, zia there's a question uh, for you which is what type of product and process diversity do you think will be effective for the industry to start with mm-hmm. is that is that clear or i think it's it's quite clear question thank you so much um, i think uh, what type rather than i think we need to understand what is our basket um, roughly 32 to 34 billion dollar we ship it 2020 is not a benchmark 2019 let's say right. which is 6 to 7% of the total world consumption and if that came 70% came from a five category i think you know i think we talk quite a lot about vietnam uh, vietnam is taking our second place or third place but yeah. uh, i think china already have more than 30% volume that you know or for the world total consumption they do it so i think we have a time to look into there uh, and um, i don't believe so much about luck that vietnam just because of by luck they become this i'm sorry for this uh, but i think we didn't do our homework we've been so much feeden by the buyers honestly speaking the customer came with a briefcase that hey this is the order you do it and we just follow that that's why we didn't work proactively on our innovation or product development well there is a certain suppliers who are doing much better than lot of chinese or even korean suppliers so i that's not a benchmark for the industry yeah but uh, uh, if you ask me that what is the next one i rather first see that we need to understand what i can do what is the platform we have yeah i i will not take a longer time i will just say one thing let's say if you talk about denim business in bangladesh we certainly have more capacity than we can produce right because there is less demand so what is started we we create our own problem because all of a sudden there is a more uh, you know capacity than the demand the price gone obviously really really sharp down and then the blaming comes out instead of that before i just copy paste a capacity from here to there why don't okay. i think what can i produce more so uh, i think it's a lot of proactive work and you know i, I will urge that uh, the industry leaders together with obviously government because government play a role with the investment green investment sustainability and others at the same time the education came in their picture so it's a total effort i cannot just rightly say hey you produce this product it's a huge work because this 40 years it takes a journey yeah. for this industry so it will not happen for only one right answer there is no one right answer perfect sorry i i answered a little bit diplomatically but that's a harsh reality perfect no thank you so much for that uh, zian hopefully whoever has uh, asked that question you have an answer uh, to quite an extent hopefully um uh, swapna there's a there's a question for you and uh, i see professor is a little busy but i'll come back to you professor um uh, i'll i'll uh, come to swapna first Uh, Shobhana, there's a very interesting question. It says, "How inclusive are our factories for differently abled people at the moment?" Uh, thank you very much, whoever asked that question. Uh, I think if I give you the example when we started in 2007, I really don't think anybody thought, okay, uh, that we will be able to actually bring them under the mainstream labor force, yeah. and. the question was always whether they will be able to do it whether they will be able to come out whether they will be able to be efficient but let me just tell you uh, yes obviously we have got all the social stigmas difficulties odds there but then this 3000 workers that we have and 50% of them actually 60% of them are female their absenteeism are less they are way more efficient we have we have done the mapping they are way more efficient than probably the able one and then there five to six of them are the best workers consecutively 
for three to four years. So they have proved that they can be part of this main labor force. And we are still not able to bring it to across the you know, supply base probably. But the progress that we have made for three, this 3,000 and the profitability that they have shown, I think this is the time that we can actually make them for the mainstream labor force for the across the factories. Perfect. Shobna, thank you so much for bringing that back. I'm sure uh, because I mentioned about this uh, project, which is so close to your heart early on, uh, I'm sure that prompted the question, but uh, thank you for uh, uh, giving a little bit more details on the project. Uh, Professor, if I could come to you and I could pose this question from the audience for you. Um, and of course, Zia and uh, Shwapna, if you have uh, reflections, please do jump in. Um, but I see that uh, before we do that, we've got about four minutes. So if we can briefly answer the last question, because I want to end with some very clear pointers from each one of you on where do we invest today on this, on this uh, uh, path, right? So, Professor, the question is, um, the audience is very keen to know that while there is a potential shift towards reshoring, right? Because we've seen over the last 40 years, there's a lot of um, uh, offshoring that has happened and that's the reason behind Bangladesh and Vietnam and India's of the world coming up. Um, but there is a potential reshoring of manufacturing to the West, back to the West. Um, the audience wants to know what are you thinking about it, or how does how does this affect some of the things that we've been discussing about in product diversification and building that value-added products muscle uh, within the industry? I'm, I will just point out two things here. I have thought a lot about onshoring and reshoring. Yeah. Possibly, if it ever happens, it's going to happen with most basic products because those are the things that will be repetitive products you know easier to make with robotics and all so yeah. maybe it will become cheaper to make it but look at the amount of investment that they have to do to to have these kind of you know uh, robotics you know to do that kind of a production and that is probably going to happen in a smaller scale the whole world's production cannot be robotized you know, and even if it is robotized, it cannot be robotized in five years or 10 years time. So look at electronic car, EVs, like electrical vehicles. Do you think conventional vehicles is a totally different technology? One is internal combustion engine, the other one is, is an electrical EV. So do you think the entire internal combustion engines that are running in the whole world will be replaced tomorrow by an EV? It's not going to happen. So there's going to be a transition and that this transition could be between five to 10 years. I don't know how long. So that's one thing. And number two is the human, I, I, I mean, on an extreme situation, I would say the people in five, 10, 20 years might be fatigued out of so much of robotics. And, you know, you know they, they might want human touch in the product, you see? So those are the things, and then not everything can be done by you know, robots. You know, there will be elements that, are, that needs to be attached. So I don't think we should be scared of that, and we should continue doing whatever we are doing. And, and if you are asking me, since my, you, know, you wanted to know where should we invest, we should invest in technology, we should invest in people, we should invest in our backward language, we should invest in our country branding. Okay, that's it. Uh, fully, fully agree with Mr. Momen that product needs human touch. You need to touch it, feel it, because you wear it. It's so close to you. You Zia, can't have only robots. Zia, I'm going to put you on the spot. We've got less than a minute before we are, uh, we are asked to uh, leave the space. But what would be that one thing that uh, you would want us to invest in as an industry? Only one thing, that's human resources. Okay. If you ask me. And then the second thing, so we need to really work on a uh, on a, together on an industry, the customer and the government to create a clear roadmap to create that ecosystem that what Shopna was mentioning or even Momansar was mentioning and together with that. And if there is no one solution for this yeah. as a multiple part of the ecosystem is so Perfect. important. Perfect. Shopna, what would be that one thing that we should invest in today? Without innovation, innovation and technology. You like it or you don't like it, technology is going to come and you have to have that ecosystem to embrace it as soon as possible. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much. I think we've just run out of time, but it's been such a pleasure talking to the three of you and thank you for 
bringing in a very refreshing lens on the topic. Um, you can take it from me that we'll be in touch with you next week and we'll pick up on the conversation. This is Thank not you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Pleasure to be here. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you. All so the best. Thank, Thank you. you very Thank much, you everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye. Take care, everyone. Thank you, audience. Bye-bye.